I invite your attention to the passage that was read just a few moments ago, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. If you hear me call his name Isaiah, bear in mind that's the way we pronounce it. In the islands, and I'm in New Jersey, I'll try to talk like someone from New Jersey. But uh, my subject is from the entire chapter. And the subject is Jesus Christ's atonement. This passage in this 53rd chapter of Isaiah's prophecy is probably the passage that sets forth the atonement of Jesus Christ in more depth and in more clearness than any other one passage. We'll be looking at the passage, but looking at some other texts as well on the subject. And it's a glorious subject, this subject of Jesus Christ's atonement. You heard the passage read just a moment ago, but consider that word atonement for a moment. What does it mean? Simplest meaning of the word is just looking at the three syllables, and it means at one meant. That's what an atonement is. It is an at one meant. It speaks of two parties estranged from each other, perhaps in animosity or against each other, but it speaks of them as having been brought together so that the two become, become at one with each other. That's about the simplest meaning that you can find of this word atonement. And when this atonement is made and when this atonement is effected, you'll find that the offending party is forgiven and the parties are reconciled to each other and with each other. Atonement is quite simply at one meant. The subject of atonement is found especially in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy that set forth the law. The work of atonement was a work of the priest of Israel. Repeatedly you'll find expressions in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy that say that the priest shall make atonement for him and his sin shall be forgiven. And repeatedly, just when you get home, look up that word atonement. Found how many times it is found in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and, and how often the phrase is found. The priest shall make atonement for him, and his sin shall be forgiven. And that's what happened in Israel. A man offended God and had done that which was contrary to God and, and had brought the disfavor of God upon him. The remedy was to find a sacrificial animal that was suitable to God and bring it to the priest. The priest would slay the sacrificial animal on the altar, shed its blood. The blood would cover the man's offense and God would pronounce the man's sin forgiven. And when that occurred, a reconciliation was made between the offending sinner and God and they are once again at one meant. Now everything that you read of that priest in Israel in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy point toward Jesus Christ. They're all pictures of him. Every one of those passages is a picture of Jesus Christ as our high priest, one greater than Aaron and the one making atonement for sinners under God. Sinners like me who have offended God and have estranged myself from him and have through the work of a high priest, been brought together again with God so that between God and me there is now at one meant through Christ and through his atonement. We're going to consider tonight that Jesus Christ made a gracious atonement. Jesus Christ made atonement for many sinners. 
Jesus Christ made atonement for specific sinners, and Jesus Christ made an efficacious atonement for them. That's my four points. We'll look at those four points tonight by considering the first, that Jesus Christ made a gracious atonement. It was an atonement that the sinner did not deserve and that God was under no obligation to give and that Christ was under no obligation to obtain. It's thoroughly gracious, thoroughly gracious. It is gracious, first of all, because the offending party did not deserve it. In this, the passage we read that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. With regards to Jesus Christ, we who have received this atonement confess that he is despised and rejected by men. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Well, that person most certainly does not deserve atonement, does he? His sin has estranged him from God, and not only is he estranged from God, he is estranging himself further and further from God, and he does not deserve this atonement. This atonement is gracious because God graciously purposed it. Did you notice in reading in verse 2, it pleased Jehovah to bruise Jesus Christ. Jehovah has put him to grief. You made his soul an offering for sin. Jehovah purposed this atonement. It was he who directed the high priest and Christ is the priest. But it was he that purposed the high priest. It was he that purposed the sacrificial that was made before God. And God purposed it. God decreed it. God set it forth. And it pleased God to put him to grief. It pleased him. It pleased his law. It pleased his justice. And it pleased his son who made the atonement, who who purchased it and the one who obtained it. In verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted and yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shivers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. When it came time for this priest to make an atonement, when it came time for this sacrifice to be made, when it came time for this one to have his blood shed, he did not balk. He did not stall. He did not withdraw. He did it. He did it freely, graciously, and lovingly. I say to you, I say to you with, with great joy in my heart, this is a gracious atonement. No one deserved it. No one deserved it. God had, If God had damned our whole race, we would have deserved that. This atonement this atonement is gracious to those who did not deserve it by God who purposed it and by Jesus Christ who willingly has made it. Second point, Jesus Christ made an atonement for many sinners. Repeatedly we find this here in our text before us tonight. Look in verses 11 and 12. Jehovah said of Jesus Christ, My righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. He bore the sin of many. Well, that's clear enough to me. <laughs> he said it once, and then he said it again. He made that statement many, twice. So uh, this is an atonement for many sinners. Now, common logic will tell you that many, while it is fewer than all is more than a few. Common logic will teach you that. If God had given atonement, if Christ had made atonement for even one sinner, just one, that was infinitely more than our unworthy race deserved. If Jesus Christ had made atonement for quite a few sinners, 
That is even more, infinitely more than our race deserved. And I know that's not proper English, but you do get the point, do you not? It was infinitely more than infinitely more than we deserved. He did more than that. He made atonement for many. Many. How many? We're not told. No man knows. God does. Christ does. Holy Spirit knows, but no man knows. In heaven, when they congregate, we're told that John says, I saw a great multitude that no man could number. A multitude that no man could number. He identifies them as coming out of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. So that when the redeemed, when the reconciled, when those for whom atonement are made well, are gathered in heaven, there are people from the seven continents and the islands of the seven seas, and it's a multitude. No man can number it. That's the grace of God. You want to see God's grace magnified? Not one sinner deserved it, and God and Christ made atonement for a multitude of sinners that no man can number. This doctrine is set forth in other places in the Scriptures. Christ confessed of himself that the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many, Matthew 20, 28. Christ declared at the institution of the Lord's Supper that my blood of the new covenant is shed for many for the remission of sins, Matthew 26, 28. The writer of the epistle to the Hebrews declares that Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many in Hebrews 9, 28. Folks, it cannot get any clearer than that. Some will say, well, we believe that uh, he made atonement for all with that exception. Well, if it does not bother you to contradict God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's scriptures, and all God's preachers, you go right ahead. The scriptures declare he made an atonement for many. For many. And they are specifically identified. They are given very specific identity. They are identified as Jehovah's people here in verse number 8. Jehovah said, for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Does it get any clearer than that? For the transgressions of my people, who were or who are these ones whom Jehovah calls my people, these are they whom God foreknew before the foundation of the world and from old eternity. These are those whom because God foreknew them, were chosen to salvation and justification and, and, and sanctification. These were those who before the foundation were made to be the recipients of God's free and sovereign grace from old eternity. These are those who through this atoning work of Jesus Christ in time on Calvary were made to receive its benefits even before the foundation of the world through the blood of the atoning lamb that was shed before the foundation of the world on the altar of, of God's heaven. These are those whom were foreknown by God, chosen by God to salvation, justification, and sanctification were predestined before time began to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and to be God's adopted children. These are those who before the foundation of the world were highly favored to be accepted in Christ. And in Christ there never has been sin, never will be sin. So therefore, we know that their justification, salvation, and sanctification are eternal even before the foundation of the world. Proof of that is in Christ. They are in Christ from eternity and in whom we have redemption. These are God's people. These are Jehovah's people. When Jehovah says, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken, this is who they are. 
all whom Jehovah foreknew, chose, predestined, highly favored, and even glorified from all eternity. For the transgressions of my people, although God's decree had purposed their salvation, justification, and sanctification before time began, the work had to be wrought and it was wrought on Mount Calvary. For the transgressions of my people, Jehovah says, he was stricken. Jehovah's people, we who have received this atonement, are glad to identify ourselves also in this very same passage here in Isaiah chapter 53. We who are the many who are Jehovah's people can truthfully say of Jesus Christ that Jehovah has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Verse 4. He was wounded for our transgressions. Verse 5. He was bruised for our iniquities. Verse 5. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Verse 5. And by his stripes we are healed. If you are one of Jehovah's people, that's your confession. He died in your place instead. He suffered the wrath of God that you deserved. And by his stripes, you are healed, you are saved, you are justified, and you are sanctified. But elsewhere in scriptures, elsewhere in scriptures, these who are Jehovah's people are identified I get somewhat amused when you go to a text and you set forth what it means and someone doesn't want to believe it and, you know, says, well, you'll be, but does the Bible say that anywhere else? <laughs> and, you know, have, okay, folks, let me ask you, how many times does God have to say it? How many times did I hear my father say, if I told you once, that was enough? That was enough. And, and it was, it was. And uh, God said it once. Yeah, but did he ever say it anywhere else? Well, okay, I'm glad you asked because he did. He did. Repeatedly. Folks, this is the doctrine of God's word. Repeatedly. Jesus Christ made atonement for God's people. They're identified as Christ's people in Matthew 121. You shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. They're identified as Christ's friends in John 15, 13. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. This is atonement for God's church. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, the church of God he purchased with his own blood. This is atonement for Christ's sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And this is atonement for God's Israel. You probably are quite familiar with the text I just quoted to you. I want to read one to you, and I want you to look at it, and it's not far from my text. Isaiah chapter 45. Locate that, if you will. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 45. And I want you to look at verse number 17. Forgive me, that is Ezekiel chapter 45. That is Ezekiel chapter 45. The last eight chapters of Ezekiel's prophecy are prophetic of the church this day and age in which we live. Ezekiel wrote of a future time. He wrote, to the, wrote and delivered this to the children of Israel. And I'm sure that most of them did not understand what he was talking about. In fact, we read that the prophets read their own writings trying to, what did I just write? What did Jehovah just tell me to write? They searched their own writings trying to understand 
you know, what, had, what, what they had written. I wrote what he said, but and I'm not so sure I understand it. And, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you can imagine... You can imagine Moses and Elijah when they're with Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration and you know, whoa, now we see how it happened. And when when they when they have, you know, been received in the glory and there they see, yes, it was Calvary. We did not know. You know, we, we prophesied of it, but oh, this is more glorious than we could have imagined. Well, this whole section in the prophecy of Ezekiel is much like this. Ezekiel wrote of a future time and undoubtedly did not understand exactly what it was he was writing, but he wrote. He wrote. And then he says, it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings. Well now, the prince's part. The prince's Messiah, Jesus Christ, by the way, but uh, notice, it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings, grain offerings and drink offerings. Perhaps Ezekiel says, Lord, um, the prince's part? Yes, yes. Do you not mean the priest's part? Well, the prince is the priest. Lord, the prince comes from Judah, and he cannot make an offering. And that's true. And the priest comes from Levi, and he cannot be a prince. Yeah, that's true. But the prince shall make an offering. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, I'll write it. <laughs> it shall be the prince's part, the prince's Christ, to give burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings. Every Israelite knew what those were. At the feast, the new moons, the Sabbath, and at all the appointed seasons of the house of Israel, he shall prepare the sin offering, the grain offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings to make atonement. Your King James may say reconciliation, and it was a reconciliation, but this is the same word that throughout the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy is translated atonement. It means atonement. The prince shall make atonement for the house of Israel. Who is the house of Israel? Jehovah calls them my people. Christ calls them my people. The Holy Scriptures call them God's church. The Holy Scriptures call them the Israel of God. This is for whom the atonement is made. I had a professor in seminary, and uh, he hated the doctrines of grace, and particularly, did he hate the doctrine of limited atonement, definite atonement, particular redemption, hated it. He was teaching one day in class, and uh, he said that the priest shall make an atonement for all the house of Israel. And he said it was for all the house of Israel. You see, he said it is an unlimited atonement. All the house of Israel. Well, in the student body on this campus, 400 and close, maybe close to 500 students, there were about three, maybe four of us, maybe five, that uh, believed the doctrines of grace. And we were not allowed to discuss the atonement on campus. It was a law. And, uh, yeah, I was there to get a degree, okay, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, were, we were not allowed to discuss it. I was so tempted. Professor, did the priest make atonement for all the Gentiles outside Israel? And uh, I knew a certain student before me in the same school, and uh, he had a habit of asking questions like that to the same professor, and the, the same professor would, you know, one day he stopped him and told him that his grade had been lowered one whole letter for the term. And that's, you know, so, you know, okay, I don't want my grade lowered for, the whole, for a letter for the whole term. So I did not ask the question, but uh, the young man of whom I speak, he was a bit more bold than I was. His name was Don Fortner. But <laughs> he, he contradicted the professor in class and, 
and, and proved what he was saying and proved the professor wrong, and his reward was to get his grade lowered, one grade for the term. But, uh, but I want you to, I wanted to ask that question. Did the priest make atonement for all the Gentiles outside the house of Israel? Well, of course not. Of course not. Folks, this is a particular redemption. This is an atonement for a particular people. Jehovah said, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And then, number four, final point, Jesus Christ made an effectual atonement, one that succeeds and will never fail. I should not have to stress that fact. I should not have to stress it. Did not Ezekiel and do not the rest of the scriptures say that he will make atonement? If he was prophesied to make atonement, did he not make atonement? Is not atonement made? Well, of course it is. Of course it is. The atonement is made. It therefore is effectual. It therefore is successful. It therefore is efficacious. I say to you that not one single solitary sinner for whom Jesus Christ died will suffer and perish God's condemnation. Will not, will not, will not. Not a one of them. In fact, what do we read? Verse 5, by his stripes we are healed. Verse 11, he shall see the labor or the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Verse 10, he shall see his seed, for Christ will have no stillborn children. Verse 11, the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand, for Christ will not fail in what he purposed to do. And in verse 11, by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Folks, it is done. Signed, sealed, and delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Atonement has been made. Atonement has been made. Well, some may say, but does the Bible say that anywhere else? Anywhere else? Yes, Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, all who truthfully confess that Christ died for us will be justified by his blood saved from wrath through him, reconciled to God through the death of his son, and saved by his life. This is what is said of these that have their atonement through Jesus Christ. My friends, I love this atonement. It is successful. It is finished. It is completed. It is a perfect atonement. It will never fail. And that's the doctrine of God's word regarding it. And yet, and yet, people calling themselves devout, faithful Christians will contradict everything that was just said and claim to be preaching the gospel. They claim. But he, 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 he did not die for just many he died for all with that exception. Well, God said it was many. Yes, but it was all with that exception. And it was not limited. Not limited. No, he died for everyone. Not only for God's church, but for Satan's church. Not only for God's people, but also for Satan's people. Not only for those who will believe the gospel, but those who will not, who will not believe the gospel. They say, he died for all without exception. But did he succeed? Um, well, he did what he came to do. But, but did he succeed? Did he make an atonement? Oh, yes, he, 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 he made an atonement. So he made an atonement and reconciled to God every sinner for whom he died. Oh, no, he didn't do that. All those folks in Hades right now. Did he die for them? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, then his death didn't mean much for them, did it? Well, it's their fault. 
not his, they say. All those folks in heaven, uh, did Jesus Christ's death guarantee they were going there? Well, no, it only made it possible. Did he make an atonement? Well, he actually provided it. It was conditional. It's conditioned upon man's faith. It's a condition upon man's obedience. They say, they say. Not an effectual atonement, a provisional atonement, a conditional atonement. They deny God's grace because their doctrine of atonement requires man's works. They deny the efficacy of Jesus Christ's death because they confess that most everyone for whom he died is going to hell anyway. They impugn God's justice. This is serious, folks. They impugn God's justice in saying that God punished Jesus Christ for the sins of everyone on Calvary, and then he's going to punish them again for their sins in hell, as though God requires payment for the same sin and debt twice. That's unjust. That's unjust. The hymn writer says, Payment God will not twice demand, first at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. They, folks, by the time they're done, they not only have contradicted God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the scriptures. They have set forth a heresy, and yes, I dare say it, it is blasphemous. It is blasphemous. This doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ is glorious, of God's grace for many, and not a one of them deserved it. For a specific people, Jehovah's people, and I'll give you one more qualification for them. Who are these for whom Jesus Christ made atonement? They are all who believe the gospel. Now go to the first verse in Isaiah chapter 53. The first verse in the prophecy. And notice that this prophecy begins with a question. I have set forth to you tonight this doctrine of Jesus Christ's atonement. That's the gospel I preach. That is the report that I am making to you tonight. I have set forth from this passage, just as the prophet did, he set it forth. I have set forth to you tonight what he set forth. And now I ask you the question that he asked, who has believed our report? Who has believed it? Who has believed this doctrine, this gospel of the atoning death of Jesus Christ? Who has believed it? He answers the question with another question. Notice the first question. Who has believed our report? The answer to the question is this. To whom has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? That's the answer to the question. To whom has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? If Jehovah has come before you in your sin and if he's rolled up his sleeves, made bare his mighty arm and come and wrought a work of faith in your heart, you're going to believe it. You're going to believe it. That's what he's done. He has made bare his mighty arm to these for whom Jesus Christ has died and they confess, we believe it. We believe it. Who has believed our report? Everyone for whom Jehovah has made bare his arm. And they delight in this doctrine of the atoning death of Jesus Christ and the atonement that our prince and our priest has made for us. And I exhort you, if you've never believed in Jesus Christ, if you've never trusted in him, don't walk out that door before doing so. Don't walk out. God, who is gracious to sinners, is just as just to those who reject Christ. 
don't walk out that door tonight until you have known this atonement that Jesus Christ has made. Until you know that you are at one with God that God has made bare his arm, given faith to you, and you have put that faith in Jesus Christ. And you know that you are now at one with God. And know God our Father, to the glory of your name and to the honor of your Son, bless your word and this report we have made. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.